Tantse Anin Bouju. Hello and welcome uh, to the Toronto Reference Libraries, Bram and Bluma Apple Salon. This evening is part of Toronto Public Library's signature salon series, and uh, I'm Rosanna Deerchild, host of CBC Radio One's Unreserved. We are here today to welcome the fabulous Wab Gijig Rice and discuss his fabulous new book, Moon of the Turning Leaves. Who's read it? Miigwech, wow. wow. Well, I'll try not to do any spoilers, but I can't promise anything. Um, I loved it. It was a wonderful book, just as Thank the you. first one was. Um, the post-apocalyptic thriller is the hotly anticipated sequel to the 2018 novel Moon of the Crusted Snow. In that bestseller, Wab Gijic introduces us to Evan White Sky, his family, and his tight-knit Anishinaabe community in northern Canada. It follows them after they are caught off from the rest of the world amidst a societal collapse. In Moon of the Turning Leaves, we return to Evan White Sky and Company 12 years after the lights go out. In the years since, a mysterious cataclysm event, Evan White Sky has led his community out of the res and into the bush uh, where they've been rekindling their Anishinaabe traditions. Please make welcome my friend, Wabgija Grace. Ooh, miigwech. Miigwech. <laughs> thank you very much, Rosanna. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. It's a true honor to be here. Uh, I was actually born in Toronto, so this is a homecoming of sorts. And, uh, yeah, just very delighted to uh, visit with you all this evening. And, uh, yeah, I guess I'll read a little bit. Of, yeah, of that'd book. be great. Okay, cool. Um, I'll just read the first uh, few pages of Chapter 1. <laughs> uh, this is uh, pretty much a reintroduction to Nangos. In the first book, she's just a little girl, and now she's a teenager, a uh, leader in her own right, uh, an expert hunter, expert bush skills. And with all those uh, talents, uh, she's eventually tasked with a pretty big job. Uh, so I will uh, read the first little bit of um, an introduction to Nungos and then Evan, her dad. This is chapter one. Water, la water lapped against the low hull of the boat, its rhythm synchronized with the poles on the float line as the small white plastic pods that kept the net afloat knocked against the shiny metal of the vessel. Hand over hand, 15-year-old Nungos yanked the white nylon net over the gunwale trim, pulling in the green and gray fish that flopped onto the curved deck. The rippling water around the small boat bounced jewels of light back up towards the sky. Nungos hunched her long torso over to survey the morning's hull. Three smallmouth bass so far, another three pike, and a couple of smaller pickerel. She looked from her deeply tanned hands to the bin on the floor of the boat and estimated she'd pulled in about half of the net already. She'd hoped for a few more fish. Two days had passed since Wawaskone was born, and Nungos had proudly taken on the responsibility of harvesting food for the feast to celebrate her niece's arrival. On short notice, she decided that netting fish in the lake was the best option for a quick return, but it had only been a couple of weeks since the last netting, and she'd worried the lake stock was running low. A lot of the fish caught so far this season had seemed undergrown, and she'd heard similar complaints from other fishers. The 10, 13 footers she'd rode out on rocked as she hauled in the net, but she kept her hips loose to prevent it from tipping. Since the age of five, Nungos had practically lived on this lake, splashing along the shore with her brother Mine Gun and other kids, rowing out to other inlets to explore, and walking along the ice and cutting holes to fish in the winter. The lake lay just steps from their settlement, which they called Shkidinakiwin, or New Village. It was wide and deep, and teeming with fish when they first arrived, and her people called it simply Zagagan, the word for lake in their language. From the middle, rocky and sandy shores were visible in every direction, illuminated by the sun, which had cleared the tree line in the east. Nungos looked north back at the settlement. When she, her fam when she and her family had made this land their new home, a half day's walk from the crumbling homes and buildings of the old reserve, they had laid out their new community in a loose circle. The open space in the middle was kept clear for ceremonies, celebrations, and the play of children. Over the water, Nungos could hear the chatter of little ones in the distance as the community awoke just beyond the shore. The lodges lining that central space were inhabited by the five extended families who first came to Shkidinakiwin, led by Nangos' father, Evan Whitesky. She could see her own family's pair of dome dwellings made of a frame of tied saplings and covered in canvas and plastic tarps, lying closest to the shore on the outskirts of the permanent camp of 10 more wooden lodges ranged around the central gathering hub. 
The ceremonial lodge was the largest structure, standing about a meter taller than the other buildings, and easily within Nongos' line of sight from her vantage out on the lake. Like most other buildings in this community, it was shaped into a dome, stretched out on the ground like an elongated oval. Walter, the eldest survivor, had instructed Evan and the other younger adults to build it this way, in the manner of the old medicine lodges of the Nishnabek. To Nongos, Shkidnakiwin was physical evidence that separated the time before, what they called the Jibwa, from the world she knew now and that made up most of her memories. When her parents and their people were building this village, they erected an extra two dwellings on the periphery in case any holdouts hoping for the lights to come back on at the old reserve, named the Gowandakong for the abundant white spruce trees there, would eventually turn up, needing shelter. Like her uncle Chuck, her mother's cousin, who had first refused to live in the bush, and Dave, the elder Walter's nephew, who remained in the community garage at the old site for as long as he could, half believing the machinery there, the power transformers and trucks, would one day work again. Nungos remembered those two among a handful of others, trudging through the snow, cheeks gaunt, eyes bloodshot, to join them after most of the holdouts had died off. The final few, few floats that buoyed the net thudded against the gunwale as Nungos brought it in the last of it. Five more fish, all notably smaller than usual at this point in the season. There were 13 altogether in the heavy green bin, a few twitched in their final nervous throes of life, but most had died shortly after being caught in the white weaves of the net, unable to move and push water through their gills. Nungo sighed and looked back to the shore. Adults were beginning to bustle in the central glade and along the shore. Some collected firewood, others built, uh, hauling water in buckets. Most of the plastic tarps and canvases covering the dwellings were being readjusted or removed in preparation for the coming summer heat. Seeing people out now for daily tasks turned her attention back to the headcount for tonight's feast. After everyone ate, the rest of the morning's catch would likely last her family a week at most. A loon flapped its wings low to the water as it passed through her line of sight. She grabbed the handles of the long, light aluminum oars, the oarlocks creaking and rattling as she settled into place to row homeward. As she pumped her right hand to slice the oar's blade through the water and point the bow to the shore, the outlines of the muscles in her arms stretched and constricted in a steady tempo, as she paddled herself smoothly to land. The bow came to a stop on the muddy shore, scraping loudly as the hull dug into the rocks below. With the boat firmly planted among the lush green reeds of the shoreline, Nungo stood, turned, and climbed up onto the seat in front of her and made her way to the front. The metal benches had captured the heat of the morning sun and warmed the bare soles of her feet. She leaped over the side and splashed into the shallow cold water, which came up to her calves. The summer solstice was approaching, but the lake would remain fairly chilly until the peak of the summer heat. Nungos walked around the bow and began to tug the boat out of the water and up onto the shore. Need help? A familiar voice murmured from behind. She turned to see her father walking down the grassy slope to the shore. Evan White's guy's hair was freshly tied into a braid, and the sun reflected off the sheen of his black crown. He raised his hand to shield his eyes from the glare coming off the water. Kaween, replied Nungos. It's not that heavy this morning, sorry to say. She pulled, the boat up, she pulled the boat up onto the grass and let it sit. Evan came to her side and they peered down into the bin of fish, shoulder to shoulder. If I caught those with a hook, I would have thrown them back, said Nongos. But they got caught in that net, so most were already dead. We'll make use of them, Evan said reassuringly. Might be time to find better fishing spots, she suggested after a short pause. Let's just clean these for now, her father replied pulling the bin of fish out of the tin boat and turning to walk back up the slope. Nungos followed, carrying the other empty bin and the tattered nylon net. They ambled up from the shore and onto a plateau where their family's two domed lodges stood, each entrance facing a large central fire pit. The larger structure to the west was draped in green canvas tarps, faded by sunlight but mostly intact. A slightly smaller lodge was covered in a shiny, crinkled blue plastic tarp that rustled with any movement. The greenhouse stood tall enough for full-grown adults to walk around upright inside with sufficient headspace. The blue dwelling stood lower, primarily a sleeping space, and a separate home for Nangos' brother, Mayingan, and his partner, Piche, and their now newborn, Wawaskune. Evan carefully placed the haul of fish on the grass in front of the fire pit. Nangos tossed a big plastic bin and white net aside as they each took a seat on one of the stools arranged around the pit. The morning sun climbed higher and the soft humidity from the lake began to bead on their sun-darkened foreheads and bare shoulders. A piece in gushe, Nungos asked, not seeing her mother anywhere. She went out to the garden earlier to get some stuff to cook with these gigonyuk. Then I think she was going to go see your aunties for a little visit, Evan said. I think a bunch of them are going to come by. They all want to see your little shemis. Where's the rest of them then, asked Nungos. 
Inside sleeping still, still pretty tired from it all. She wanted to see the baby girl again, but didn't want to disturb the new parents. They sat in the comfortable late spring stillness. The sun climbed higher, accentuating their arid surroundings after several days without rain. The flies would descend upon them soon to feast on bare arms and legs, and they could only cover them up with long sleeves and pants or swat them away until the wood smoke from the evening fires provided a shield. Evan set to cleaning the fish and Nung was to mending the net, which they both agreed could use some work. She grabbed a handful of the fine mesh from the bin and pulled it up to eye level. The nylon threads keeping the net together were still strong enough to trap with, but scanning it up and down, she noticed some dire holes. It was their last net of this kind. Hide ties won't work for a net, Evan reminded her. They'll just soak and get loose and fall off. Maybe some spruce roots would work. Within her short lifetime, they would have been able to buy new nets, hewn from thin but sturdy nylon strands from the people in the towns and the cities to the south. Food and tools would come up to them by air. In the winter, provisions came up on trucks that rolled along the ice. But her father rarely indulged her questions about things like airplanes, trucks, and satellites, and Nongos had mostly given up asking. The words and markings on their older tools and clothing, the things they had, hadn't made themselves, had become increasingly intangible to her. Now it seemed that almost everything that had come from Zhaonong, from the south, that other world, down there, was fading away and falling apart. She had been three when the power went out, and only five when her father had led their people off the old res and into the bush. But Nongos held on to fading memories of bright lights and soft furniture and rumbling cars and trucks that once took them from place to place. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you, Wob. That was Thank you. lovely. You may have a future in broadcasting. <laughs> a ship has sailed, I think. <laughs> I think I still see a dot on the horizon. <laughs> now, uh, 12 years ha has passed since the events of Moon of the Crusted Snow. Um, when we lost, uh, lost, saw Evan and his uh, family, they were in the bush relearning their traditional ways. Um, so for those who have not yet read the book... Where does this uh, book, Moon of the Turning Leaves, take us? Why are they leaving the safety of this camp, and where does the journey go? Well, the new settlement they create is more or less a refuge, but it's a renewal for them, right? It's a chance for them to start over after everything we know now has fallen apart. And they're really, I think, energized by this opportunity to reclaim what had been taken from them. But they realize after so long in this place that the resources around them are starting to dwindle. Um, there had been some failed attempts to uh, do some exploration in that sort of decade-long gap. And they've been traumatized not only by the recent events of the blackout, but also their history as indigenous people, you know, uh, of being displaced, of being brutalized by the colonial state, and so on. Um, so they've, they've stayed isolated, um, and they've been able to sustain themselves but they realize that you know, fewer animals are coming around to hunt. They're getting fewer yields from their gardens and from the bush. And, and they have this revelation that traditionally in the Schnabek were migratory. You know, they would move around according to food supply and according to season and so on. So that's the first thing that prompts them to go on this journey. And the other thing is you know, they don't really have any answers from the blackout. And they decide maybe now it's finally time to find out. But what's really uh, motivating that the most is the opportunity to reconnect with their original homeland because they've been originally displaced from the north shore of Lake Huron to far northern Ontario. So it becomes this quest of, of discovery, of, of hopeful reconnection, um, but also uh, uh, of you know, re-energizing themselves as Anishinaabek in their traditional homelands now that they've been liberated by this catastrophe that has really pushed them beyond the state that had oppressed them for so long, right? So, so it's all those things, I think, wrapped into this, this uh, wild and wacky quest uh, through the bush. <laughs> so why did you want to revisit this, this Anishinaabe community and these people? I originally didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Peer pressure, my friends. <laughs> it works. No, I originally did, hadn't ever considered a sequel at all. You mm -hmm. know, um, uh, at the end of Moon of the Crest of Snow, I, I felt like the characters were riding off into the sunset, and, and you know that was it. 
you know, I was done with them. Uh, but when I started doing events like this, people would ask me about a sequel, and, and I would be honest and say, no, I'm, I'm not thinking about a sequel. And then people would be really bummed out, and I was like, oh, man, I'm, I'm being a total downer to these, like, fans of this story. So I started, you know, massaging the truth a little bit, and I'd say, oh, you know, I'm thinking about it. And, you know, when you, you tell yourself a lie so often, it becomes the truth, so... Eventually, I, I started thinking about it, and um, that turned into, uh, you know, a more fully formed idea. And uh, I partnered with my agent, Denise Bukowski, after Moon of the Crest of Snow had come out, and she said, you really should think about a, a fulsome idea for a sequel, and I'm sure I can find you a home for it. So I actually came down to Toronto in the fall of, in November of 2019, so almost four years ago, for a Tool concert with my buddies. And uh, Denise said, hey, if you have some free time, I'll get you this meeting. And she arranged a meeting with Rick Meyer, uh, who eventually edited the book, who's, who's here tonight. And Ann Rick, Collins. where are you at? <laughs> oh, he's in, in the back. The he's back. He's waiting. There he Couldn't is, get so. front seats, yeah. eh? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, um, after meeting with Rick, he was interested. And we had these, uh, these calls, probably about once a month, where he would ask me where I saw the story going, you know, who I saw being at the center of it, you know, what conflicts I saw arising, how the landscape would develop, and so on. And then after so many of these calls, um, they were eventually interested in, in offering me contracts. So mm. then there was an opportunity to make money. So I said, yeah, okay, I'll do it. I'll write a sequel. <laughs> how much, though? <laughs> Just rude. I hope you held out for a lot, though. <laughs> More than a treaty payment, anyways. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> But we're, uh, we're getting more treaty payments where we're from because we sued the government, so we won. <laughs> and I see, I see my cousins who are from uh, treaty territory, Robinson, here on Where team, are you? So. Where's the cousins at? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I see. Okay, good. Good job, guys. <laughs> so what was it like revisiting this community and these people for you? Uh, it, was, it was really fun in the end. Um, Eventually. Uh, eventually, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Even despite what happens to them, I guess. But no, like, I, um, I, I, I grew to love these characters. Uh, I, I hold a deep respect for them. And to get back into their world and, and give them new life, essentially, was uh, a huge honor for me. And it really, I think, um, invigorated my desire to, to write this story. Um, because, you know, they're the most important part of the story, right? Like, they're inspired by real people in my life um, and in my community and the wider Anishinaabek Nation, too. So it's, it's really an homage to all those people in some ways by reimagining these characters in this new scenario. So, uh, yeah, it, it really became, you know, a, a powerful emotional journey for me, too, eventually. So when you stop denying yourself and lying to people and finally... Uh... <laughs> re-entered that world did they did the characters greet you and tell you what they've been up to or was it sort of a slow telling of the story um yeah I think I spent probably you know a good seven eight months uh really just allowing the the characters to develop within my head you know and and the biggest challenge for sure was um thinking about where Nongos and her brother would be, because they're just little kids in the first book, and, and now they're teenagers. You know, Mayingan becomes a dad right off the hop, you know, first thing you see in the story. And then you meet Nongos, and she's, you know, this, this remarkable uh, young leader, right? So, uh, so, so I had to, like, um, spend a lot of time with, with her especially, and I think do um, a, a teenage Nishinaabe girl justice, right? And, and work really hard at being respectful with my approach there um, and, and trying to empower her the best way I could, you know, as, as, a, as a Nishinaabe dad in his 40s, right? So, um, so that, that was, I think, the most important part, part for me to try to get right. Uh, and yeah, just the rest of them, it was fun to, to sort of uh, get back in, in contact with them and, and learn from them again. It was, it was pretty cool. Did you have a favorite character that you were like, oh, I'm so glad that I caught up with this, this person? 
Uh, yeah, like, you know, there's, um, with Evan and Tyler especially, like, they're two of the buddies in the, in the first book. And, and I, I felt that, like, Tyler wasn't uh, fully realized as a character because the first book is so short. You know, there are some things in his backstory I really wanted to get to, and I felt like I could do that in, in a longer novel. And in some of the original characters from the first book, too, you know, like what would happen uh, 10 years later to each of us? What kind of people will we be, especially after a big uh, world changing event, which we've all kind of experienced? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so. So, yeah, it was just a, a matter of um, being well, like wondering, really just wondering what the future could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, during the months long journey that the group takes. Uh, to their traditional lands on Lake Huron, you know, the scouting party finds evidence of, you know, this falling of civilization, uh, but only like little bits at a time and small little scenes that um, really kind of builds up and you really feel like you're walking along and discovering this, um, this fall. Um, what was involved in ensuring that, that that world and that, you know, what you were building there was authentic? What kind of research was involved in that? Oh, a lot, especially when it came to the, the cause of the collapse. Mm -hmm. um, in the first book, you, you don't find out what caused the blackout, right? Even though I always had an idea, you know, uh, there was a cause in my mind. But I intentionally left that out for the sake of, of intrigue and mystery. And I didn't even tell my wife what the cause was. <laughs> <laughs> and, sure and she when, loved that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, when I started thinking about the, this one, I was like, well... Nobody's going to want to read a whole other novel and not learn anything about the, the cause of the collapse. i got to give them something. Or they're going to be pissed off at me, right? Like, I spent all these hours and I still don't know, like, what's going on, Bob? Come on. So, uh, so I took the cause, um, and without giving too, too much away, I, I, you know, did some research into that, mm -hmm. you know, um, and it just how that causes uh, infrastructure failures. And then, you know, I considered, like, a domino effect that could occur after that, too. And when you read it, you know, you may think, like, oh, there's all these things happening at once. That's kind of like a dog's breakfast of, of misery and catastrophe, right? But, you know, we saw examples over the course of the pandemic of one catastrophe triggering, triggering another and then another and another, right? So I don't think that's outside the realm of possibility to see how it's portrayed in Moon of the Turning Leaves. And at the same time, they're still all piecing things together, right? They're, they're only hearing stories from the people they meet about what happened. And they're not sure what's accurate and what isn't. And I think that's how it actually play out, you know? Um, if, if either of us was up north and we were, like, quite literally left in the dark and everything changed and we came down not knowing what happened, that's how we'd have to form that picture of, of what uh, the collapse was, right? But I think, like, having it um, set up as a long walk through the bush over the course of a, sun, uh, of a summer um, helped reveal those things, like, one bit at a time. Uh, and, like, the general premise of, like, walking through the bush for a summer is kind of boring if you think about it, right? <laughs> but so is, like, the premise of the first book where there's a blackout and they're just sitting at home on the res for months, right? <laughs> Not knowing what's going on. So... So there's ways you got to embellish each scenario and try to make them a little more intriguing, right? Oh, yeah. so. It's not COVID, by the way. So. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just so you know. Um, so as a former journalist and broadcaster, uh, how did that experience um, inform or help you write the book? Oh, it's, it's huge. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think as you can relate, like one of the greatest things about the job is meeting real people on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, and then being entrusted with sharing their stories with the country or the world, you know, that's a huge responsibility. And when you think about just how candid people can be with you and how honest their feelings are um, and how brave they are in sharing those truths um, through you, it's, it's a pretty powerful thing, right? Yeah. So I, I always really appreciated just those moments of having, you know, a real life human being share their whatever kind of experience it was from heartbreak to triumph, you know. Um, so you really get a, a good glimpse of the human experience. Like, I'm sure you, you agree with that, that, you know, um, having that firsthand account of somebody's different kind of experience in this world is just so informative, like whether you realize it right in the moment or not. 
So I'm able to be inspired by that on, on a regular basis. And that's not to say that I take anybody's real experience and then fictionalize it for, for my gain. But, you know, I'll remember how somebody responded to a certain moment and, you know, like a visual detail from that. Like uh, if someone's house burned down, uh, which is a tragedy for anyone, um, and when uh, I'll have interviewed them, you know, maybe I'll remember like how the flames flickered in their teary eyes or something like that. So, so that's something, you know, we're fortunate to witness as journalists, you know, yeah. so that, that plays in a lot to the fiction too. So not just watching a lot of zombie movies then? No. <laughs> oh, fine. So you left the CBC um, to, to follow your dream as a literary writer. How do you think it's going? <laughs> Hopefully good. You all came out tonight, so <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, no, I've just been so fortunate. Like, um, you know, I had, had a really supportive publisher and, and entire team there. Of course, Rick, my editor, was just, you know, we were on this journey together. Mm-hmm. And... Um, you know, through the pandemic, other sorts of opportunities arose, right? Like a lot of virtual visits and things like that. So, um, and, and yeah, the, just the freedom of being able to freelance and, and like do whatever I want, you know? So I don't need to fill out that form to request uh, outside appearances like some CBCers do. <laughs> some CBCers <laughs> do. Just, you know, not me. But, um... <laughs> Um, earlier you had said that you, in this book, you reveal what the big event was, which you didn't do in the last book. And you wrote about this on your Facebook, that this was based on something that happened to you. Can you tell us what that, what that was? Yeah. Well, the first book was largely inspired by the blackout of 2003, uh, 20 years ago. And I was working as a freelance journalist here in Toronto at the time, but I was home that day in Wasoxing with uh, my two younger brothers. We were house-sitting for our dad and stepmom. And it was August 14th, you know, a hot, sunny summer day, and uh, the power went out. And, you know, we thought, that's kind of weird, but we didn't really think too, too much of it until the afternoon dragged on and it was still out. So we got bored and we got into the car and drove into Perry Sound, into town, which is about a 10 minute drive away. Uh, And we saw that all the traffic lights were out, all the stores were closed, and we're like, whoa, must be a big deal if uh, the power's out in town too, not just the res, you know? So we saw some friends downtown, and uh, we stopped and talked to them. And one of them had heard on the radio that it was this huge blackout. Uh, you know, big cities like Toronto, Ottawa, Cleveland, Detroit, Boston were all in the dark. And nobody knew why. Nobody knew when the power was going to c- come back on. And we got freaked out. And we got back in the car and, like, hightailed it back to the res. <laughs> <laughs> like the safety of the res like that that's literally how we saw it and the whole drive back we were like making our survival plan uh (laughs) we we were getting ready and we got back to the house and we like counted all the cans in the cupboard (laughs) and we like collected firewood from the backyard because obviously the electric oven was useless now forever we thought right (laughs) And uh, we even did the thing where you take the, the top off the back of the toilet, and, like, in case you need to drink that water later or whatever, you know? So, so we made this whole survival plan, and uh, night fell, and we were just all talking, um, and we thought, okay, you know, tomorrow we should go check in on Graham again, you know, we should go see our uncle over here who might be able to lend us some fishing lures or might have some live bait, or we should go to see our auntie over here um, who might be able to teach us about getting different kinds of medicines if we need it now and the more we talked about that the more comforted we were Uh, we're like wow you know we're in the most ideal place for the end of the world because we're surrounded by people who are hugely resourceful with land-based knowledge and really you know didn't live with electricity or anything like that just some decades ago you know uh, and, and it was like really, um, empowering at the same time. It was like, this, this is the Anishinaabe way, you know, we don't need all these luxuries of modern technology. And we woke up the next morning and we got our fishing gear together. Cause we're like, okay, like fish is on the menu forever now. So <laughs> let's, let's go fishing. Uh, but just before we left the house, the power came back on. So, <laughs> so, uh, we turned on CBC and like, 
we saw the, all the images coming in from Toronto and Ottawa and uh, cooked up some craft dinner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, put put the bo bo boiled the water. You know, <laughs> celebrated by putting the hot dogs in the craft dinner. You know, it's real, just real uh, luxurious. <laughs> put the toilet thing back. <laughs> yeah. And then started playing video games again, and then like our, <laughs> our survival so like, clan. We're on the Chanel Bay. Hey, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah, our survival plan was like up in smoke. It was gone, right? <laughs> but, but you had uh, it in your back pocket. Yeah. No, that moment really stuck with me, and I was like, oh, it'd be cool to explore this in some kind of story someday. But that yeah. was that was the first moment for sure. Wow, amazing. Uh, you created a really thin line, very tenuous, um, between order and chaos in this book. Um, you know, civilization just went to shit real fast. Why did you do it that way? What were you trying to say with this sort of simple downfall that happened? Um, part of it was to just, uh, I think, highlight the fragility of it all. You know, um, we have outages here and there. Like, they happen here in the city, I'm sure, from time to time. And people lose their shit, like, quite <laughs> literally, you know. Uh, they can't live without their phones for, you know, more than a couple hours. Um, and, and, yeah, like, uh, myself included, you know. I'm, I'm not, like, uh, a bush guy anymore. I've lived in the city for 25 years, you know, for longer than I lived on the res. Um, so part of that is just to remind people of, of you know, how uh, unreliable a lot of these luxuries we've become dependent upon are. Um, also, though, like, you know, that... I see the first book mostly as, you know, about the, the moment of, of collapse, the immediate aftermath, and the struggle between good and evil um, in the months after that, right? So by putting this next book so far into the future, um, all those, I think, hard lines blur a lot more. Like, sure, there's the, the quick succession into chaos, but everything that arises afterwards is, is really much harder to define especially on a moral scale. You know, there are decisions people will make when their backs are up against the wall and they have to survive that they may not have even considered before. You know, maybe choosing violence or choosing dishonesty just to ensure that them and their loved ones are safe, you know? So, so those are sort of the lines I wanted to blur with the second one. And um, a part of like imagining the characters that far in the future really helped me do that, I think. Um, you chose to portray both a sort of a dystopian future and a utopian future, uh, depending on which side you, you, you were <laughs> on. Uh, but no spoiler, and it's the Anishinaabe that rise above and sort of go back to their traditional ways. Why do you think uh, the Anishinaabe or indigenous people in general would survive an apocalypse? Well, I think there's a lived experience of already going through apocalypse mm -hmm. several times over. You several know, there's the, the theft of the land and the displacement of the people from it. There's all the measures that followed from uh, the kids being abducted to go to residential schools to the oppressive measures of the Indian Act. Uh, these are things that, uh, you know, most families, most indigenous families have firsthand experience with, you know. And it was a discussion with my grandmother um, uh, that really prompted me to look that way. And it was about a year after the blackout. Um, I had been visiting her, and there was, like, all this news coverage about, you know, a year after the blackout, where were you, blah, 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 you know, all that stuff we usually see. Mm. And uh, I said, yeah, Graham, you know, that blackout, that was pretty wild, eh? And I was like, I thought it was the end of the world. And she's like, oh, the end of the world, you know. It, she's like, oh, that's already happened to all of us, you know, so many times, right? And she reminded me, like, where we're from, our people, you know, our res is an island on, on Georgian Bay. But our people originally inhabited the mainland, and they freely walked, you know, uh, along the shore of Lake Huron until Indian Affairs interpreted the Robinson Huron Treaty to say that, no, you can't do that anymore. You have to go down to this island, and that's where you're going to live forever kind of thing. Mm. So it was really confinement to, like, essentially what the government wanted to be an open-air prison essentially, right? Um, and then everything else followed, and my, my grandma reminded me of that. So, so like, with that, you know, lived experience, <clears throat> you know, her grandparents' generation were the ones who were originally removed. That's just a few generations removed from me, right? Uh, so that perspective was really crucial. And I was like, well, you know, if you look around us and see what some of us have been able to revive and maintain, it's, it's really inspirational, uh, of course, there's still a lot of hurt, a lot of trauma. There's still a lot of things that need to be repaired. But looking at what we have now uh, in the aftermath of the apocalypse is, is, is wonderful, if you think about it, you know? Um, and now people are empowered to really work harder to restore a lot of those things. 
um, with the full knowledge that this is, you know, objectively a dystopia, Canada, for a lot of indigenous people. You know, if, 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 like languages are gone, customs are gone in many places. So um, I think trying to flip that script and show what we've been able to do is not necessarily like utopic, but, you know, it is more hopeful, as you say, and, and, and hopefully, you know, it can uh, allow people that perspective to feel triumph and joy again, for sure. We're just about ready to take some questions, so get yours ready, but I still have a few more, and I wanted to ask you this, and I'm not, I'm not sure we can actually ask this question without giving anything away, but I'll try my best. <laughs> At the end of the book, as I was trying to read through my tears and cursing your name, <laughs> you'll get there and you'll do the same thing. The epilogue did save me, though, so I didn't punch you in the face. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's well, why I learned martial arts to protect myself that's uh, right. from Rosanna. You got a brown belt. But I am an anti and a menopausal, so don't, <laughs> don't even. Um, it was very sad, but it was also very poignant. Um, what were you trying to say with that last scene with Evan and his daughter? Um, well, that, to me, that, that was my... Uh, <laughs> I won't give anything away. No, the, um, of course, you'll imagine that they're the central figures. They're there at the end of the story, right? Um, like the epilogue was was my favorite part of the whole mm, thing to write. Beautiful. It, it, it really was, I think, an opportunity for me to be more futuristic um, and really to, I think, transpose those hopes I have for all of us, not just Nishnabek, for for Cree people, Haudenosaunee, uh, whoever else across this this continent, this Turtle Island. And, and maybe what we can hopefully accomplish someday, right? Uh, so that's where a lot of that came from. And, and, you know, that's not to say, like, it's my utopian vision of the future because there are some difficult things that happen on the way to that, as, as Rosanna uh, alluded to. Uh, but I think the messaging is pretty clear, and, and we embody a lot of that messaging today by what we do, you know, by reminding people that Indigenous people still exist on this land, our languages are still spoken, you know, our ceremonies are, are able to happen out in the open because they were hidden for so long, uh, and, and, you know, it's like we didn't go anywhere, you know, uh, we're still here, right? So, so that, that, that's what I really wanted to try to capture for sure. And finally, Wob, by my count, there are two more seasons. <laughs> so uh, are we going to return to this world, or what's the deal, yo? Well, I won't rule it out because I don't want to disappoint anybody. You know, I learned my lesson. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I do have an idea for what a third could be, but it's, it's like, to me, it's so ambitious that there's a great chance of failure, so I don't even want to say what the idea is. Um, maybe I'll get to it someday when I'm a bit older, but I need, to, I need to write something else, man. Like, the end of the world stuff for the last almost 10 years is just, you know, it can be a grind, right, emotionally. So, uh, next I want to write something a little more joyful, you know, like a, a res comedy kind of thing, you know. Um, <laughs> And, like, I have some of the greatest teachers, right? You know? So, uh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, I won't rule out coming back to this world, but it's not going to be anytime soon. Oh. Everybody with me? <laughs> and the peer pressure begins. There it is, yeah. Well, Wob, thank you so much for this conversation. We're going to take questions in a minute. But okay, thank you all Rosanna. for uh, laughing and being loving. Wob, Deja Rice. Present it to your child.